praise God, praise God from all blessings flow and praise Him.
enter into that throne room, that we would let everything go, our past, our present, our future, that we would truly recognize freedom, that we would truly recognize the blood and the body of Jesus Christ.
Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all of your works and consider all your mighty deeds. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I will remember the deeds of the Lord, Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let your unfailing love surround us. Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Good morning, Graceway. My name is Nick Hart, and I'm the middle school director here. Uh, if you would join me in reading of the word, we're in 1 Corinthians 11. Verse, starting in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the word world. I think so many of us come uh, to this church, and it seems like there are, are masks at the front door. We go throughout the week and we have lunch and dinner every evening and, and oftentimes we hold these bitternesses, uh, these frustrations, this unforgiveness in our hearts and, and as we come here through the door, even driving up here, we're still frustrated and then we walk through the door and, hey, good morning, how are you doing? Oh, <laughs> glory be to God, everything's great, you know, and, and we play the part so often. And Paul kind of writes this passage um, because many of them were making this feast just like any other feast. And the irony is, is that they were holding this unforgiveness towards each other in a remembrance of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gave to us. It almost seems idiotic for, us to, for me to say that out loud but so many of us take the bread and take the cup almost like it's an allergy pill. And we throw it back really quickly, just like it's a normal part of our day. But we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Paul says, so many of you are sick and weak and, and dead. And, and I think the same is true today. So many of us come in here and we're sick inside. We're weak and, and many of us are dead emotionally. We're having a hard time. 
going through this life. And Paul says, don't see the chastening of the Lord as God's righteous anger, but, but see it as, as a glorious reminder, right, for who he chastens, he truly loves. I think it'd be good for us this morning if we took some time. Some of us on our drive here, we, we had frustrations, frustrations going through our heads. I know that it's hard for me not to sin just on the drive here because people, the way that they drive, I walk in, I have to you know, ask God for forgiveness before I walk through the door. I, that's just the way I drive. I'm sorry if it's one of you that I've pointed at, you know, but um, that's all I do. I just point really, really angrily like that. But... Um, but if that was you, uh, I'm sorry, but this is a time. In verse 28, Paul says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. We'd like to invite you guys into a time to where we can examine our hearts. We can take a moment and let God speak to us and really see if there's any roots of bitterness, of frustration, of unforgiveness here within our body. Paul says, get it out of the way. If we're truly remembering what Jesus Christ gave us on the cross, he forgave our sins, but yet we're frustrated because our child put their shoes on backwards or our husband set the dishes on the counter instead of the sink. And we hold that against each other as we take this cup and we eat this bread. How ironic it truly is. And so as we come together in this time, we're gonna give you guys some time just to reflect upon your hearts, just to let God speak within you and, and let him find any roots and then go to your brother. This is the time. If you need to ask for forgiveness, go to your brother, go to your sister. And then eat and drink of the cup worthily. Let's pray. Deal. Yeah. In just a moment, we're gonna give you the opportunity if you would like to come down here to the altar and just uh, ask God to help you in the area of forgiveness. You know, uh, God's a God of forgiveness and reconciliation. Here's the thing. We can't always reconcile because reconciliation takes two beings, humbling themselves, coming together. But forgiveness is within your means. You can forgive, and you can relieve the pressure in your life. You can lose that person that offense and begin the healing process in your own life. And the process of forgiving someone who has hurt begins with prayer. It really does, because there are some people we say, forget it, I don't want to deal with them, I, I can't forgive them, uh, the way they treated me for a period of time, the, the way they offended me, I cannot forgive them. Okay, so what you, what you and I do is we ask God for help in that area. God, instill in me a desire to forgive that person. God, through your Holy Spirit, give me a desire and pray that it's every hot. day. It's hot up there. Because we've got to let it go. We've got to release that person to God and begin our healing process. Will you take a few minutes this morning and if you stand, if you will, and if you have a prayer need, maybe you want to get just cleaned up as far as the Lord's Supper before you take it, or you just want to ask God, God, help me to forgive somebody that's offended me. You're welcome to come down to the altar today. And we'll have somebody here pray with you if you would like, or, or you can pray right there where you're at, all right, as we sing. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. Our 
Your glory, God, is what I. 
Right, as we uh, continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I think it's one thing very important for us to understand is what this church uh, at Corinth uh, was like. Uh, because when you read, especially if you study the Bible through the book of 1 Corinthians and even 2 Corinthians, you're like, man, Paul is hard on these guys. I mean, he's just addressing issue after issue after issue. And what we need to understand is this church at Corinth was the church, first church of its kind. It was a multi-generational, multicultural multi, you know, sociological classes and middle class and lower class and upper class. It was, it was the first church of its kind where all these different people were coming together. And if you look at the book, especially at 1 Corinthians, you can see through the entire book, Paul is calling them over and over again to be unified. Not because they're poor Christians, not because they don't love Jesus, but because they're very different, unique people from different backgrounds, from different places. They have different personalities. It encourages me today as I look out in our audience. We have a church like that. We have a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational church. Because of that, sometimes it's difficult to be unified. It's difficult to be of one mind and one voice. And as Paul continues, even in this observation of the Lord's Supper, he gives these instructions to be unified. And so let's continue to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17. He says, now, I, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together. Not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. You know, it's kind of funny, when Paul is writing his letters to the churches, you guys know this if you read through the New Testament, about the first five verses are all the greeting, right? He just, hey, you know, this is me, and this is who's writing, and we love you. And, and then it's, it's usually verse 6 that he starts actually writing to them, that he actually begins, you know, the letter. And he makes it all the way to 1 Corinthians and to verse 10. The first five verses are fluff. He gets to verse 10 before he has to deal with the fact that there are divisions in this church, and here he is talking about the Lord's Supper again, and he's like, hey, I, I hear that there's divisions among you, and I believe it, because I know it's tough. I know you come from many different places, and I've seen it. He spent 18 months at this church, building this church. He understands. Keep reading in verse 20. He says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before, his, before other his a supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, have ye not houses to eat and drink, and or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. I think what's happening here is people are coming, and, and the elements of the Lord's Supper are out before them. And, and as people are showing up, they're treating the elements of the Lord's Supper like it's a feast, and they're, just, they're pounding it. They're, they're just eating it all. And then the people that uh, show up, like most of us do five minutes after the service starts, um, those people show up, and the elements are gone. Some are having it all, and others are not having any. Paul writes to them and says, don't you have houses to eat in? That's, that's not what this is for, and many people debate exactly what is going on with this feast, and, and there's a lot more happening with culture than we have time to talk about this morning, but I think there are two things that we can learn from what Paul addresses here, and the first one is this. They missed the purpose of why they had come together. When they came together and they had the juice and the bread before them, they came together for the special time of the Lord's table. The idea was that they would be drawn closer together with each other, and they would be drawn closer to the Lord. But instead of doing that, they used these elements to satisfy their own appetites. In fact, I could say it this way. They came with a consumer mindset. They came wanting to get, wanting to eat, making sure that they got theirs because the line's getting, getting pretty long, so I'm going to go get mine real quick. 
It was, it was a kind of a, of a me first attitude. Good thing that never happens in churches today. I want to try an experiment real quick. I want to get a little crowd participation here. I want you to look to the person on your right and your left, and as kind as you can possibly do it, I want you to say these words. Me first. Go for it. Me first. Okay, it's really, really hard to say me first in a kind way, isn't it? I mean, I don't know how you're going to do it. Uh, Me first. That's kind of the intimidating way. Or you could say it like a question. Me first? Or you could, you know, if, if you're that, you know, class clown and you got to, me first. <laughs> uh, you know, or whatever. There's no good way to say me first. But showing up at church, and treating the Lord's Supper like it's golden corral. <laughs> you know what they were doing? They were saying me first. It happens in churches a lot of times. We show up at churches, and it's okay. I, I have these tendencies too, but we want the music to be just the way we like it. And we want the preaching to be just the way we like it. And we want people to welcome us the way that we want to be welcomed. If that children's ministry isn't top-notch, see, we come with this consumer mindset. We, we think sometimes, and it's okay, we live in a consumer society, right? We, we all struggle with this. We see it everywhere else we go. It's consumer, consumer, consumer. And, and if we're not careful, we forget the fact that we don't come here for what we get out of it. We come here for what God gets out of it. He deserves our praise. That's why we're here. And I hope our children's ministry is fantastic for you. I hope we partner with you the way we should. I hope you connect with worship like I have this morning. Jake almost made me cry today. We, we talked about my shame is undone. I'm like, great, I'm speaking in, in two minutes, and I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> All those things don't have to be just the way I like them. We start missing the fact that it's not about me and my preferences. It's about coming together. The second thing I think that is happening here is that they dishonored God because they did not honor one another. Verse 21, it says this, For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper. One is hungry and another is drunk. What have you not houses to eat in and drink in, or despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? Paul says, I, I can't get behind you on this. I can't praise you for that. You're not doing this right. And one thing that I think we need to consider here, when we come into this place, when we come to the Lord's table of all things, we are called to remember. What does remembering do for all of us who come from different places and different backgrounds and different seasons in life and different races? What does this do for us? This reminds us of the one thing we have in common. This reminds us that at some point in our life, we had a collision with the cross that forever changed our life. And we didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to earn it. It was by the grace of God that we became a part of God's family. And that's what we have in common. And the thing that we have in common is more important than anything else that we can't agree on. That's one of the things this was meant to do, to remind us of what we have in common. The problem is not our differences. You ever think about that? It's not a problem that we're different. Everybody stick out your thumb real quick. Give me a thumbs up. Go ahead and do that. Some of you in the back row, you're not, you're not, I see you. I see, way back. Okay, there we go. You know what you have? You have an identity mark that nobody else on this planet, almost 7 billion people have. That's yours. We're all very different. The, the diversity is not the problem. Look at creation. God loves diversity. How many different kinds of monkeys? How many different kinds of dogs? How many, whatever. He loves diversity. The problem isn't our diversity. The problem is, is when we value our preferences and the way that we want things more than we value our brothers and sisters. As we come to this next portion this morning and as we approach what Christ has done for us in remembering that, I wonder if you'd do this with me just for a moment. Could you just close your eyes and just examine yourself for just a few things? Could it be, and I'll do the same, could it be that we have come to church as consumers of God's goodness and not contributors to God's greatness? Could it be that we come into this place week after week and we care more about our preferences than we do about our fellow man and our brothers and sisters in Christ? Could it be as we approach this day today, we care more about the things that we don't want to let go of than what God freely offers us? As we approach the Lord's table this morning, could we just for the next few moments 
lay everything else aside. Join together in one mind and one voice. Remember the cross. Remember the radical love of Jesus Christ that has changed our lives forever. And let each one of us learn to value what we have in common over what we do not. As we sit and wait in response for the Lord's Supper, um, I'm going to invite the, uh, the deacons and the servers to come forward. And, and as they do, I'm going to read scripture and uh, I'm going to have you guys respond. So I'm going to read and you're going to respond. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all the lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. My name is Jim Lee, and I'm a care pastor here, and I'm also uh, working in discipleship. I want to direct your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you would look there with us again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 verses 23 and 24, and as you turn there, I would invite the deacons to begin dispensing of the elements. We've been focusing on what body life is all about. And you've heard words like unity. And we know the Lord's Supper reveals the death of the Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. I've been thinking as I was looking at verse 23, isn't it interesting that the scripture says in verse 23 that the Lord Jesus, the same night, the same night, what did he do the same night? The same night he, he picked up the bread. The same night he picked up the bread in front of his disciples and he broke it. And he began to tell a story and talk about what would be happening. What would be happening that same night? You know what would happen that same night? It's the same night he was betrayed and he was broken. And he took up the bread as if to show, I'm gonna be broken. I'm gonna be broken. We've been focusing on what body life is all about. You know, part of body life is betrayal. That's the part we don't like to talk about. Part of body life is about betrayal. I wonder how many people here today have felt betrayed. Maybe you've been betrayed by a good friend. Maybe you've been betrayed by a spouse. Maybe you've been betrayed in ways that you never thought you would ever be betrayed and you're broken. Jesus, that very day, that very night, took up the bread and he broke it. And he said, 
this do in remembrance of me. As I was broken, you're going to be broken. As I have suffered, you're going to suffer. It's part of what the Christian life entails. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. the deacons to come forward. While they're coming forward, I'm going to read you a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. How many people feel troubled today? Would you raise your hand? You feel troubled? Yes. Amen. He says, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body. Look at this. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Did you hear that? He says, we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our flesh. He says, verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this. Don't miss this. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. As we partake of the Lord's Supper and you lift that piece of bread. I want you to consider that Christ was broken for us. And I want you to consider that his life is our life. Take, eat. Deacons, if you could continue passing out the cup. Verse 24 says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 continues the thought. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The cup filled with the blood of the grape is a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ in which all believers have already partaken. It's your salvation. We drink the cup showing the death that he died that we might have life. There's one passage I want to share with you from Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 starts out very depressing, but you know what I suspect? I suspect there's a lot of us in here today with very heavy hearts that are going through some very difficult times. And I want to read a very depressing passage to you. In Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said, son of man, can these bones live? Isn't that the question that you'd ask yourself this morning? The bones were very dry and God says to him, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. And he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought up you out of your graves. I shall put my spirit unto you, and you shall live, and I'll place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. As the deacons come forward, we take the cup, and we think about the blood that was poured out for us. The scripture says that when Jesus Christ was crucified and given up the ghost, a centurion walked up and pierced his side, and the Bible says that blood and water came out. And we think of Isaiah 53, he was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. And I want to pose the question to you, congregation, to you, children of God, those of you that feel dry, those of you that there is no life, those of you there is no hope. You walked into the valley of the shadow of death, and there's nothing but dryness. There's nothing but death. I want to remind you what the Lord's Supper is about. It's about unity. It's about death. It's about forgiveness. But it's about hope, and it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has risen, just as he said. And now Christ is in me, and I am in Christ. I am alive in him, and there is hope. For those of you here today that say, there is no hope, let me just tell you this. I believe that God, I believe this with all my heart, I believe that God walks through the valley of dry bones, and he says to each one of us in our hearts, and he says, child of God can these bones live can these bones live what say ye congregation what say ye can this place live how about our homes how about our marriages how about our children how about our community can these bones live? And what I would say to you is, yea, verily, not only can these bones live, but these bones will live. This place, Grace Way, this place will live. This place will rise up by the grace of God. Your life can rise up. And you say, well, how can this happen? Because of the blood. Take Drink ye all of it. You know, part of what we do as a church is we reach out and we bless others. And sometimes, like 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you, so it is in our community. Sometimes 
we have to pay a price. We have to sacrifice to see others live and come to life. Back in the information area, main lobby, there is a card back there that says, Reloved. Don't you like that? Reloved. And as you turn it over, it's an invitation to attend church on Easter morning, April 20th, at our 9 and 1045 time period. It says, Easter is the time that we reflect upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the payment of our sins, and we celebrate his defeat of death and the new life that we can find in him. Graceway loves our community. For every first-time visitor that fills out a connection card or online guest form, we will donate $5 to Community Link. This is an opportunity for us, this is an opportunity for you to have a little handbill that you can give to somebody at your work, at your school, and say, hey, I wanna invite you to what we have going on. By the way, anytime anybody that comes to our church on Easter morning uh, and you fill out the information, we're gonna donate money to Community Link. And I just wanna invite you to be my friend and come on that day. So Grace, well, I wanna invite you to grab one of these today. Don't leave home. Don't go home without it. And let's ask the Lord to continue to do the work that he has for us. Death works in us, but life in others. Grace team. In the valley God will
truth. 